knowledge and history helps you to understand the people, the culture, and where it all began. It helps you to understand the present better. or locals mm. like us were not allowed to come here. Wow. Interesting. So when it was due for us to gain independence, symbolically, and also to kind of spite the British, he chose the same grounds mm -hmm. where he made his independence speech. Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of the memorial built on this particular mm -hmm. ground. Mm -hmm. So as part of our tour, we're going to visit the museum where we got his pictures mm -hmm. and some of his personal stuff. Mm -hmm. We also have a mausoleum where oh. he was laid to rest. Oh. And there's also his statue and other ones on that side. Um, we're gonna end up in the lounge where we get to sign the visitor's book. Is he alone in the mausoleum or you have other With heads of saints in there? Or he's his alone? His wife. Oh, his wife. His wife. His wife. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Any children? Four children. Four children. Mm -hmm. And they are also alive. Oh. They are alive. They're alive. Yeah. Beautiful. So let's come to the mausoleum first. Mm -hmm. Often in our villages in Africa, when our farmers are from their farms and time, they rest under the shade of a tree. So it's very down there, and we believe he's also resting under the shade of a tree. When you look at the shape of the right on the let's take the right for example, from up the bay, it looks like a huge machete, which has been reversed or turned upside down. We call it the royal sword or the state sword. Traditionally, when you hold a sword upward or when the blade is made face up, it means war. But when reversed like this, it represents peace. Meaning all he did in those days were also done in the name of peace. But just that he was not well understood mm -hmm. by some. The black star up there stands for all black people. Mm. Symbol adapted from Martha's garden. This happens to be his third burial place. Wow. They moved a couple of times. Now, Dr. Kwame Kroma was from the western part of Ghana, a town called Improfo. And since 2009, his birth date, September 21st, has been part of our national public holidays. It's called the Improva Memorial Day mm -hmm. to honor him. He had his early education around his hometown, but was later trained as a teacher in Accra, a school we call Achimota School. He completed, taught for a while, but later won a scholarship to study in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So he went to Lincoln University mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania State mm -hmm. for his undergrad, where he studied economics, sociology, and theology, mm -hmm. and also pledged to a fraternity. He belonged to Fabio Second oh. Lincoln. So from Lincoln University of Pennsylvania, where he got his master's degree, he read education and philosophy. After you he went back to Lincoln University to teach in African history and languages. And even in the early part of 1945, he was also voted Professor of the Year at Lincoln. But late 1945, he left the US altogether to England to pursue his PhD at London School of but whilst in England, he then got an invitation from the first political group that was formed back home for him to return and help the struggle for independence. I'm the only heard about him because he was someone who had always been very passionate about Africa that is liberated and also united, so what we call Pan-Africanism. So in England, he got himself also involved 
in organizing some pan-Africanist conferences. He became very popular in London. That's how the, how come the group over here heard about Mohammed Krohman. He joined them as their general secretary, but a year and a half later, he left that group due to issues of ideology. He was very radical, so was saying independence or self-government now. His friends were saying later, in the shortest possible time. So he left. And later, to also put some kind of pressure on the colonial government for independence, he then declared what he called positive action against British colonial rule. Mm -hmm. By that, he was organizing a series of protests against the British for independence. And his catchphrase then was that, quote, we prefer self-government with danger to servitude in tranquility. Mm -hmm. That brought some chaos. Mm -hmm. So the colonial government had him arrested. He was then charged with organizing an illegal strike and also treason. Mm -hmm. So they sentenced him to serve a three-year jail term at James Fort Prison, which is just down the road here. But whilst he was still in jail, our people were also putting pressure on the colonial government so he could be released. That then forced the British to organize elections to elect people into our first local parliament. Likely for Kwame Nkrumah, his name was also added to the ballot as a candidate, even though he was still in jail. The British only allowed that as a mere formality. But that later became a mistake for them because when the elections were over, he actually won. <laughs> so he got elected while from jail. So that forced them to release him prematurely. He had served one year, two months, sort of three years in jail. And they only released him because he got elected. <laughs> he came out and became the leader of government business, he worked with the colonial government until it was due for us to gain independence. So on the eve of 6 March 1957, he chose this particular ground where he made his independence speech. And Ghana was the first country south of the Sahara to get independence then. So when he was making the speech, among those, one of the things he said was that um, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it was linked up with a total liberation of the African continent. And that it was time to Proved the whole world that given the same opportunity, the black man was also capable of managing his own affairs. So he actually inspired and influenced independence across the continent and also part of the Caribbean. Soon he became our prime minister, whilst the Queen of England remained our head of state. And three years later, July 1st, 1960, Ghana became the public, and then he got sworn in as our first president. So he led us and did what he could for us, and he was someone who also had strong socialist views. So all his policies were driven by that. But unfortunately, that also got him on the bad side of some key Western countries, the US especially. Mm -hmm. So point, the U.S. government held back foreign aid to Ghana mm -hmm. because of where he stood. That made him to look elsewhere for aid to build his country. Mm -hmm. And he got him closer to <coughs> most of the so-called communist countries. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Cuba, mm -hmm. and then the Soviet Union, and China. Mm -hmm. And because they were communist, the U.S. also branded him mm -hmm. as a communist. Mm -hmm. And later, after most countries on the African continent had gained independence by the early 60s, he and some leaders on the continent helped to form the Continental Union, the then OAU, now the AU, the African Union. But later, some of them also had a strong view that political unity alone for Africa was not enough. But then there was also a need for Africa to unite economically so we could protect our natural mineral resources from continuous foreign exploitation. Mm -hmm. That over time made him a threat 
and the target for Western attack. Mm. So unfortunately for him, in 1966, 24 of February, his government was overthrown mm. in the first military and police coup d'etat in Ghana. He was then not even in the country, he had taken a trip abroad. He was then on his way to Vietnam. One of those who were then appointed as mediators during the then Vietnamese war. Mm. But he left here upon the request of the US government. So whilst he was away, convenient, mm. some of his army generals stayed the military and police were behind him. So the broken statue you saw out there mm. was destroyed during the coup. It used to be complete. Mm. So that eventually sent him into exile mm. in a country called Guinea, mm. also in West Africa, where they accepted him mm. and also made him their co-president because he played a key role in Guinea's independence struggle as well. Mm. That was where he lived until he fell sick in 1971. They took him to Romania for proper medical attention where he died of prostate cancer mm. in 72 at 63 years old. Mm. So they embalmed him in Romania and then took him back to Guinea where he was given a state funeral and burial as co-president. Mm. And then three months later, they transferred him from Guinea back to his family house in Ghana mm. because at the time he died, unfortunately his mother was still alive. Mm. And he happened to be a bit the mother's only child. So she requested the brought him back. That was where he was until when Ghanaians thought that he deserved a proper national memorial for all he was able to do for us and the continent at large. So this was built in 1991. And when he finished here, he was then transferred from his family house. So he stayed and hopefully his labs in mm. Western um, This is built of Italian marbles, mm. but the architect was Daniel. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Mm. And even though the coup against his government was locally staged, we found out later it was actually foreign funding. Mm. That was after some of the files of the US CIA got classified the early days that show the US involved <laughs> for two obvious reasons. One because he was a socialist mm. and most of his friends were coming. Mm. So he was very good friend the late Fidel Castro of Cuba. And when he died, Castro came to Cuba. Secondly because he had become the most influential African leader and the one also the, the talk on pan Africanism and say things like Africa is for only Africans and that we must protect what we have from foreign exploitation, which was and still is a threat to Western interests because most African minerals are largely mined by Western companies anyway. So they serve as a threat because we were very influential as well. And that's how like this government was eventually and to make a more practical statement to his talk about Pan-Africanism, he eventually married an African. His wife was an Egyptian, who was called Fakia Nkrumah. And their union was also a politically arranged one. It was done by the then Egyptian president, who was called Gamal Abdul Nasser. It was kind of an attempt to unite Arab Africa, the South African Africa, let's say Black Africa. So that's what happened. And they had three kids from the marriage who are all surviving. But before he married his wife, he had a son from an earlier Ghanaian relationship. So that makes them four. And two of them are also active politicians currently in Ghana, but in different political parties. Now, his wife passed on just in 2007, mm. back home in Egypt. And not long after she died, the news came from the children that during her last days, 
one of her wishes was to be buried near the husband. Mm -hmm. So it was discussed by the dead government. It was eventually agreed. So they brought her back, gave her also a state funeral, and then they also brought her. She was made here at the time, the as well. Zandi, where he made his independence speech from, 6 March 1907. And because Ghana was the first country to get independence then, among those in the crowd to listen to him deliver his time was Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. Now he came, Wolokuma gave his speech. It was after his experience in Ghana that he gave the uh, Have a Dream speech back. Um, the statue is pure bronze from Ipi and his posture means forward ever, backwards never, <laughs> which happens to be the slogan of his political party, CP, forward ever, backwards never. And since this monument was built, we've also had some prominent personalities visiting. Some of them, when they came, were made to plant trees mm. to show their presence here. So right in front of us is a mango tree, which was planted by the late Nelson Mandela of South Africa. He was here <laughs> in 1991. We have a tree also planted by the late Robert Mugabe mm. of Zimbabwe, and there are others by different African heads of state also. Now, in front of the statue, we have other ones growing on. Those ones are expressing an aspect of our traditional culture. In Ghana, especially in the south, when we have a festival or a big occasion and a chief or the king is coming, often some of his servants would go ahead of him, blow to announce his arrival. Similarly, when an important person dies, traditionally, we also blow for him. To announce the person death. So symbolically, they are doing the same thing. But the only difference is that they blow the horn in real life while standing. They don't kneel. But here they are kneeling because they are giving him honor or respect. And when you count them, we have seven of the horn blowers on each side. Um, to us, the number seven represents the completion of creation by seven days from. In 1964, Muhammad Ali visited Ghana. And when he came, he stood by the. He to take a photo. I have a picture of that in the museum. So the statue was complete. Mm. As I said earlier on, it was during the military coup that they got vandalized. Even the head of the statue was missing, returned just recently. It was only in 2009 that an old lady returned it. We were told that she was one of his supporters. So more or less she found and kept the same mm -hmm. for all these years. And for us to also keep the history still alive, that is why the head was mounted separately from Some copies of his books here for sale. The Africa Machine, right? Mm -hmm. 